Good evening, friends. I am Michelle Tarter, a member of Haddonfield Monthly Meeting. On behalf of my meeting, I welcome you tonight as we celebrate our 300th anniversary with a very special event, an evening with the esteemed scholar and historian, Jean Soderland. Jean is a professor of history emeritus at Lehigh University and author of several important books, Quakers and Slavery, A Divided Spirit, published in 1985, Lenape Country, Delaware Valley Society Before William Penn, published in 2015, and a forthcoming book, Separate Paths, Lenapes and Colonists in West New Jersey, which will be released this summer in July of 2022. When Linda Lotz asked me for a speaker recommendation to help us celebrate this momentous anniversary of our meeting, I thought instantly of Jean. In 2018, she was a contributor to my book, New Critical Studies on Early Quaker Women, and her work in that volume was groundbreaking. She looks closely at letters, diaries, town records, deeds, friends meeting minutes, any primary texts from the 17th and 18th centuries that lead us closer to understanding the early friends in the colonies, including those from the Delaware Valley and in our very own meeting. I am so excited that Jean is here with us tonight to share her important work. Please join me in welcoming her as she gives her presentation titled from Shakamoxon Island to Haddonfield, Quakers and Lenapes in early New Jersey. Thank you very much, Michelle. Now I'm going to try to share the screen with my PowerPoint. Thank you very much for this invitation to contribute to your 30th anniversary at Haddonfield Monthly Meeting and to Linda, Michelle and Josh for arranging the talk. First, I would like to acknowledge that I live and have lived for most of my life in Southern Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people. I am also grateful to my many friends and colleagues who have shared their insights with me. My book, Separate Paths, Lenapes and Colonists in West New Jersey is going to be published by Rutgers University Press in July of, of this year. I'm excited about it. I've been working on it for, in some ways since the mid 1990s, in other ways since uh, I finished Lenape country. Uh, one of my friends has says, says I've been working on it all my life. So <laughs> it's uh, something that I'm looking forward to having published. It's based on considerable research, uh, but more can be done, much more can be done because not enough work has been done on West New Jersey. And I encourage others to explore the region's history. One thing that we always have to acknowledge and think about in talking about relations between Lenapes and, and colonists is sources and the bias that's embedded in the sources that we have to use. The Lenapes, like other natives of North America, had an oral culture, communicating information and preserving their history through the spoken word. They expected to seal agreements at conferences and to exchange gifts. Archaeologists have found important evidence about Lenape culture and trade in their work. European documents provide important evidence but require historians to deal with inherent biases, obvious in biases, and we have to read carefully and comparing sources. And as historians, we absolutely have to recognize that we ourselves have biases and that we also have our individual perspectives. So that there again, I'm not trying to say that what I talk about today and what I say tonight um, is the last word. 
you know, either in terms of research or in my own thinking. My talk will focus on the Lenapes of the Southern Delaware Valley, particularly the Armawamis of the Timber Creek to Cooper River watersheds and their interactions with European cultures, uh, European colonists. We have no accurate portraits of Lenapes from the 17th century. Uh, they're actually more like cartoons, uh, which we have from that time period. This portrait is of the Lenape Sakima or leader, Tishkohan. And it gives, uh, I believe, a good depiction of Lenape dress and appearance uh, during the colonial period. He is shown wearing European cloth, which was common among Lenapes by as early as the 1650s. When the Europeans first came to the Delaware Valley, Lenapes controlled the area from Cape Penlopen in Delaware, uh, on the south side of the Delaware Bay, north through southern New Jersey to Trenton and uh, through Pennsylvania to about the Lehigh Valley. This was the Lenape people I'm discussing tonight lived in this region. The Lenape people to the north are also called Munsees and they, they um, were sovereign, controlled the region up into southern New York in the Hudson Valley. And then the people to the north uh, who interacted with both of these groups were the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois. In the 17th century, the Europeans learned the names of individual communities of Lenapis in Lenape country. For example, the Kohansics, in what we would say is now Cumberland County, but also Salem County, the Armawamis, and these are the people we will be talking about for the most part uh, tonight. The Kohansics and the Armawamis controlled land on both sides of the Delaware River. The Delaware River was their main street, their common way of um, traveling and communicating. It was not a boundary as it is so often for us today. The Lenapes lived in autonomous towns which uh, had no overarching hierarchy. The towns probably were something like this one drawn by the uh, Englishman, John White in 1585 when he visited Roanoke um, earlier than the period that we're discussing. Uh, we don't have any comparative uh, images of Lenape towns. The Lenapes, like I said, had no central government, uh, but they did collaborate with one another for diplomacy and trade. Their economy was based primarily on corn agriculture, hunting, gather, uh, gathering, and fishing. The uh, Lenape communities took advantage of the wealth of resources in, uh, in, throughout the Delaware Valley. Throughout the 17th century and into the early 18th century, despite a severe decline in population, the Lenapes maintained continuity in a variety of aspects of their society and culture. The specific ways that were important to developing uh, society and culture in the Delaware Valley after the Quakers came included the fact that the Lenapes remained sovereign in southern, what we call southern New Jersey today. They retained their political sovereignty. 
they did not acknowledge any colonial or imperial government. They valued personal liberty within the context of community. They believed in religious liberty and respect for people of other cultures. In the 17th and early 18th century, they refused to uh, accept Christianity. They kept their own religion. They believed in peaceful resolution of conflict when, poss when possible, but they would use violence or threat of violence when necessary to keep their sovereignty, for example. Repro reciprocity was central to their culture and treaties and trade. When Lenape's made treaties with Europeans or with other native groups, um, they expected to exchange uh, gifts. And when they made uh, treaties for land with the Europeans, they expected to continue to live in the area uh, in which they lived at that time. They expected to live there, to plant, to hunt, and to fish. An example of this is with uh, several of the agreements that the Cohansics made with John Fenwick in 1676. I've just outlined uh, several of these agreements for land in what is now Salem County and Cumberland County. But the Cohansics demonstrated their negotiating strength with the terms that they established with John Fenwick. In several documents, in several of the documents, they required that they would be able to stay on the land where they lived, where their plantations existed for as long as they chose to do so. And, and that statement was included in the documents that they signed. Okay, I think it's important to discuss the history of Lenape interactions with Europeans before 1677 in order for us to understand, to really appreciate uh, their sovereignty in the region, their control of the region, and uh, who they were as a people when the Quakers arrived in Salem in 1675 and in West Jersey in 1677. Starting in 1615, they traded with the Dutch mariners who came to trade in the Delaware River. And then in 1624, uh, Lenape's in this area uh, gave permission to Cornelis May uh, to establish a small colony on Matinicum Island. Uh, they stayed there only two years um, because the colony of New Netherland was consolidated in Manhattan. But the same year, a fort uh, was permitted but, uh, to the Dutch. The Dutch were allowed to build a fort at what is now Gloucester. This was Fort Nassau, and it served as the center of trade between the Dutch and the Lenapes for quite a few years. In 1631, uh, the Dutch decided that they were going to try uh, to establish plantations in the Delaware Valley. Uh, there was quite a discussion among the Dutch uh, West India Company as to whether they should do this, but one uh, group uh, prevailed and uh, they decided to establish the plantation of Swanendale uh, near Cape Henlopen in, in Delaware. There are also plans to do the same in Cape May and uh, some Dutch had gone to Cape May and dealt with uh, natives there, Lenape's there, the Kachamichis, and had made an agreement, uh, but the terms were quite, probably quite uh, misunderstood between the two. Because as soon as it became a, uh, apparent to the Sakona Saints, who were the Lenape's of the Swanendale or Cape Henlopen area, 
that the Dutch planned large, plant, large plantations such as existed in Virginia and other major colonies, other English colonies, they decided to destroy, the Sikonisings destroyed uh, Swanendale and killed all 32 of its residents and made it clear that uh, plantation agriculture wasn't going to prevail in the Delaware Valley. Uh, they made that point uh, quite clearly and uh, managed to uh, keep plantation agriculture from developing in the Delaware Valley until the 1680s, uh, despite, despite a large scale colonization in other parts of, the, of Eastern North America. Nevertheless, um, Lenape, the Lenape population did decline uh, during the 17th century from European diseases such as smallpox, influenza, and measles. Uh, their population declined from an estimated 8,000 in the 1630s to about 4,000 by 16. 50 and 3,000 in 1670. In that same year, uh, and this shows the success of the Lenapes in keeping uh, many Europeans out of the valley, uh, in 1670, only 850 Europeans lived on both sides of the river. So while 850 Europeans in 1670 lived there, 3,000 Lenapes approximately lived in the region. Okay, going back to 1633, after the destruction of Swanendale, the Dutch captain, David de Vries, established peace with the Sikonisinks. And this was quite different from what happened in many colonies uh, because many colonies are the English, especially in Virginia and, and in New England, would use the destruction of a settlement such as Swanendale as an excuse to uh, send a, a military force against the natives. The Dutch instead decided that they were going to go back to trade in the Delaware Valley. And so sent David de Vries to make peace. After making the peace with the Sakona Saints, he sailed up the Delaware uh, to Big Timber Creek, the location of Fort Nassau. There he tried to buy corn from the Armawamis, who were the Lenapes in this area, from the Cooper River to Big Timber Creek in this area here. Here we learned quite a bit about the Armawamis at the time. I can't give you all the details, but one thing we learned learn is how important uh, women's role was in society. Because when de Vries tried to buy corn uh, from the men, the, the leaders who, it, it, with whom he was in touch, they refused until they could get the permission of their wives. And as he writes uh, in his journal, he said, when, when I offered to give them something for their wives, then the supplies were available the next day. Now, another source besides journals like those of David DeVries are early maps and here we can see a little bit more about the location of the Armawamis and other Lenape groups. This map is by the Dutch, uh, Dutchman Johannes Vingdoons, and it's dated probably to 1639. It's one of the earliest maps and most detailed uh, for the Lower Delaware Valley, and it's especially detailed for the Timber Creek area, this area here, because the Dutch 
sailors would have sailed, you know, on Timber Creek, or at least paddled on Timber Creek and gained a lot more information about the Armawamis who lived, who are indicated as living in this area. So this is additional information. And one historian, local historian some years ago said that this is really a very accurate depiction of the Timber Creek area here. In 1638, the New Sweden Company sent ships to found a colony and the Armawamis and Lenapis interacted with them. Uh, relations went quite well for a few years, but by 1644, the Swedes lacked the trade goods that they needed. And for some other reasons that we are unaware of, the Lenapis killed five settlers of the new Sweden colony just in 1644. After that point, they killed um, no one uh, in New Sweden. Uh, the problems that occurred at that point, probably because of epidemics and lack of trade goods uh, were resolved. And the, the settlers of New Sweden and the Lenapis, including the Arawamis, um, got together twice quite well. But first uh, they had to um, established peace after those, those killings. And the Armawamis were ready to evict them from the uh, river, but the council, the, the, the Armawamis council indicated that the Swedes are good enough to stay. Uh, and so the problems were resolved. This map of the Delaware Valley. Uh, this is just a portion of the map, but uh, this is by the Swedish engineer, Peter Lindström. Uh, in six, he drew it in 65, 1655, though it was published later. And West is at the top, <laughs> as we'll see in another map as well. This is, where is it? Okay, this is Petty Island here. So this would be, in this area would be Cooper River, although it's not very, <laughs> obviously not very accurate. But here's our, our Wamis. And at this point in time, the Armawamis lived on both sides of the river. Uh, they had six different towns on the uh, Schuylkill, and on the Delaware, six, four on the Schuylkill and four, two on the Delaware, uh, according to Linda Strong. Uh, they, uh, but they also had their town in, on, on the East Bank as well. Soon after this, in the 1660s, uh, because of attacks by the Haudenosaunee and epidemics, the Armawamis who lived in this area, which is, today, Philadelphia. Uh, those who survived the attacks by the Haudenosaunee and the epidemics moved, pretty much moved back to the East, East Bank and um, fortified or helped to create a strong community on, in what is now uh, New Jersey. Okay, this map is really a useful one for a couple of reasons. It was published by uh, Augustine Herman after he actually drew it in the, the time frame around 1670 that I was talking about before. There are, again, the uh, west is to the top here. And here is the area that it's like Timber Creek and Cooper River in this region here. Here is Rancocas. And not only does he indicate the location of streams and, and show you know, the depth <laughs> uh, in the river, it's, it's, this is 
the northeast corner of his larger map of Maryland and, and Virginia. But he shows the towns of the Cahansic Indians here, as he calls them, the towns of the Rancocas and Mantis people here, you know, and then the groups who lived on the Morris River here. And then we have the uh, Armawamis in this area here. Notice that he writes here, New Jersey part at present inhabited only or most by Indians, indicating you know, the sovereignty, the control that the Lenape still had as late as 1670. So in 1677, 230 West New Jersey Quakers landed on the ship Kent. Uh, they landed at Raccoon Creek uh, in this area here and were assisted over the next six months uh, by the Nappies and Swedes and Finns who lived at Raccoon Creek. The Lenapis debated about how to welcome the newcomers. And um, were worried about waves, new waves of disease that might afflict them because of the new immigrants. Thomas Budd, the Quaker, reported about several of the conferences uh, that the Quakers, the West Jersey Quakers had with the Lenapis. The leaders reported that the young Lenape men wanted war. According to Bud, the Lenape leaders, quote, were advised to make war on us and cut us off whilst we were but few and said they were told that we sold them the smallpox with the match coats we sold them. The Ganapi leaders promised the friends that they would not attack and recommended that each side negotiate for satisfactory compensation for an injury before going to war. The Ganapis also expressed their expectation to share resources and land stating, quote, you are our brothers and we are willing to live like brothers with you. We are willing to have a broad path for you and us to walk in. And if an Indian is asleep in this path, the Englishmen shall pass him by and do him no harm. And if an Englishman is asleep in this path, the Indian shall pass him by and say, he is an Englishman. He is asleep, let him alone, he loves to sleep. It shall be a plain path. There must not be in this path a stump to hurt our feet. The Lenapis intended to share their land with the Quaker immigrants, but like English colonialists in other parts of North America, the West Jersey proprietors wanted a separate path of colonization with sole ownership of the land. The Quakers and Lenapis avoided war despite the dislocation of Lenape towns that accompanied Quaker settlement. As pacifists, the West Jersey Friends avoided armaments with no mention of militias, weapons, and forts in the West New Jersey concessions or fundamental laws. In September 1677, the West Jersey commissioners acted to obtain the prime Lenape territory along the Delaware River, the huge area of fertile farmland or fertile land on New Jersey's inner coastal plain, extending along the east bank of the river to the heads of the creek. Okay, um, Fenwick and the Salem friends had already obtained or documents or agreements for the land identified as one, two, and three here. Okay, they were the first three agreements. 
1677, when the West Jersey Friends came, their goal was to obtain documents, deeds, they called them, for the land from Assunpink Creek to Oldman's Creek here. They um, inquired to the Swedes and Finns for help in, in getting translation and mediation from with the Lenapes in order to make these agreements. Okay, these two uh, areas here from Oldman's to Big Timber, from Big Timber to Rancocas included lands of the Armawamis who were here, obviously. We have only abstracts of the documents for these three grants. Um, these are abstracts from the New Jersey State Archives for two of them here. Uh, because we only have abstracts, we don't have actual marks or signatures of the Lenapes. We only know um, which of the Lenapes the colonists identified as being part of the treaties. Among the Lenapes named in the conveyance for Big Timber to Rancocas was Renawiwan of Pensalkin, who had negotiated with the Dutch and the English many times over the previous 30 years. Mekmiquan, who was also known to the colonists as King Charles, was a leading Lenape spokesperson in the Rancocas region over the next 40 years. And we know this from other agreements and with uh, minutes and, and other documents in the West Jersey records. Jack Keegan was a leader of the Armawamis. Other Lenape leaders met with the commissioners to transfer rights to land between Oldman's and Big Timber Creeks. Two of the leaders mentioned in the abstract were Talaka and Oiropa, both of whom later signed other documents in the Timber Creek and Cooper River area. A closer look at several other documents give, gives us a better idea of the goals and expect, expectations of both the colonists and the Lenapes in making these agreements. Especially enlightening is a document for Petty Island or what was known in the 17th century as the Great Island before Shackamaxon where Philadelphia is today. In 1678, Elizabeth Kinsey, an 18 year old immigrant whose father John had died soon after arrival, negotiated an agreement with four Lenapes who affirmed that he would obtain use of the island, which is now called Petty Island, for 600 Gilder sea one or 15 pounds. But the Lenapes could continue to hunt fish and dig for Tuckahoe, an edi edible root. Kinsey also agreed to provide them with a small amount of rum and gunpowder annually in return for the Lenapes protecting her hogs from being killed and her hay from being burned. This was later changed to one match coat annually, which Elizabeth Kinsey and her husband, Thomas Fairman, did pay. In looking at the signatures of the four Lenapes, one assumes that they were all men. Uh, the four, four signers included Wasakaris Oiroqua, who signed Oiroqua, who signed with a spiral and a mark, okay. Kola Hickeman and Pesakaxon. Several additional documents, however, show that Oroquo was a woman. Okay. Uh, 
there are two confirmations from 1698, which are in the Camden County Historical Society files. Um, the second one is especially interesting because here we see a Roikwa again with the spiral and with the mark, looks like bird's wings. And then the colonist had indicated her mark under the sign. And we don't often see that. And for that reason, we often think that there were very few women among the Lenape leaders. But here we see that Oiroquo was a woman and I was able to identify that she attended other conferences and was involved in other uh, treaties. During the decade after the Quakers arrived, as hundreds of new Im immigrants came and spread out across the land, the New Jersey settlement stretched north to As Asin uh, Asinpink Creek and south to Newton in this area in what became Gloucester County. By 1682, there were 1,760 Quakers in West Jersey. By 1700, there were approximately 3,500 Europeans, while Pennsylvania by that time uh, had 18,000. The West New Jersey government had established a process for obtaining land from the Lenapes and distributing it um, in the concessions of West New Jersey. The, the proprietary system described in the concessions divided the colony into 100 parts for sale at 350 pounds per full share which encouraged the investors to push for more Lenape land to market as real estate. They expected the Armawamis, Rancocas, and other communities to leave without concern about where they might build new towns. Now this, um, for Quakers, epidemics apparently smoothed the way as God brought place to help the newcomers, God's people. And I was surprised uh, by this, I will say this, and I'm still uh, looking for, uh, I guess, assistance in understanding uh, why uh, it seems quite a few Quakers at the time uh, thought, in this, thought in this way about being helped by God. Uh, to settle through the death of the Lenapes. For example, the Quaker Robert Wade believed that God promoted Quaker colonization without force, without military force. He informed his wife Lydia in May 1676, quote, in New England, they are at wars with the Indians and the news is they have cut off a great many of them but in this place, the Lord is making way to exalt his name and truth. For it is said by those that live hereabout that within these few years, here were five Indians for one now. Quaker Mullen Stacy was convinced that an impressive future awaited the colony, quote, and the Lord is mightily bringing it to pass in his removing the heathen that know him not and making room for a better people that fears his name, unquote. In addition to uh, Elizabeth Kinsey, several other colonists dealt individually with the Lenapes for land in the Cooper River, Timber Creek area. William Cooper in 1682 traded goods for Pine Point, now Camden, from the Armawamis leader, Talaka, though the West Jersey commissioners had already negotiated for that land. The Armawamis remained nearby for a while, attending the 1703 funeral of Esther Spicer, 
who operated the Cooper River Ferry. Some other examples of individual purchases included that of John Roberts at Pensalkin Creek and John Eichel at Timber Creek. The conveyance granted by several Lenape leaders at Pensalkin to William Hewling in 1685 evokes the pathos that Lenape's endured as they faced English colonization and death. The document asserts that Hewling had bought and paid for nine plantations, quote, being the whole sum and number of plantations that are Santa Clusing on the North Branch of Pensalkin Creek. The Lenape women and men promised to deliver up the territory as soon as, quote, our corn is ripe and not to cut and destroy the peach trees, nor to do any harm, any manner of harm to Hewling or his cattle. Two events, uh, and I'll, I'll discuss these quite quickly, but two events demonstrated how the Quaker colonists and Lenape's maintained peace despite uh, serious conflicts. Uh, one occurred in 1703 when Lenape's uh, were concerned because settlers who were going beyond the, uh, what was called the Indian line, uh, which had been marked out by the Indians, the, by, by the Lenapes and the colonists. And uh, the colonists at the time were saying, well, the deeds say that we own all the land up to the heads of creeks. And the, uh, leader of the Lenapes at the time, Mep Mikwan, stated to that, well, we got together and we drew the boundary together, you know, back in 1677, and we should follow that line, the Indian line. And um, at the time, the uh, Council of West Jersey proprietors said, you're right. Uh, we should adhere to that land that we marked out. And so they did, but of course, in subsequent years, uh, the settlers did obtain further land going east and uh, Lenape's did maintain their towns at the heads of, of the creeks, uh, but um, those, the towns became smaller in number as uh, more and more Lenapis either left uh, the area and went west into Pennsylvania and further west uh, into the Ohio, Ohio Valley, or as had happened during the century before, had died from, uh, from epidemic disease. The second case involves livestock. And it's interesting because livestock caused a great deal of havoc in other colonies. And in New Netherland, in uh, Virginia, and New England, often when there were conflicts over livestock with uh, the colonist pigs getting into the farms of the Indians and then the Indians killing those pigs and similar kinds of, of uh, violence. The, uh, leaders of in Virginia and New England and New Netherland often use that violence as pretext to go to war and to push the uh, the uh, indigenous people out of their homeland. In West Jersey, it appears that uh, discussions, negotiations had a better outcome because um, friends did not go to war against Jean, you just muted yourself. S suddenly something came up on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Okay. 
there's a um, kind of a bar across the uh, screen. Anyway, so a, a, a case, a complaint came into Gloucester County Court in 1689 from a colonist, Samuel Taylor of Big Timber Creek, who claimed that the neighboring Armawamis had killed his five great breeding sows with several hogs. Uh, he failed to acknowledge what those animals had done to native property, but he went to the Gloucester County Court and uh, the court decided instead of using any kind of violence, which they would not have done, that they would go into arbitration with the Armawami's leaders. And so they were able to resolve the issue. Uh, the, the, the Napi man who had killed the pigs uh, provided compensation. And so they, they did follow a peaceful pattern, but at the same time, the friends were continuing uh, and, and other colonists were continuing to take land from the uh, Lenapis. At a conference in Eastern Pennsylvania in 1757, uh, during the Seven Years' War, uh, when Lenapis and Muncies uh, had attacked settlers in Pennsylvania and also Northeastern. Uh, Northwestern New Jersey. Uh, at the conference in Eastern, two New Jersey Lenape leaders met with the Pennsylvania governor. T.D. Escombe explained why the Lenapes and the Muncies were angry. He said, you may easily see the reason of the gloomy and dark days. They have proceeded from the earth as well as from our differences and grievances that have passed and repassed. When asked for more specifics, the interpreter Kwaki Ponin clarified that expropriation of the Napi territory was the principal cause of war. Quote, and though the first settlers might purchase the lands fairly, yet they did not act well, nor do the Indians justice for they ought to have reserved some place for the Indians." Unquote. With, the, with the outbreak of war, the Quaker minister John Woolman of West Jersey came to understand the injustice of Quaker colonization. In his first essay against slavery, written in 1746, Woolman reflected the early Quaker belief that God had opened up the Delaware Valley for Quaker settlement. He wrote that, quote, God's almighty arm hath been round about us and saved us from dangers. The, the wilderness and solitary deserts in which our fathers passed the days of their pilgrimage are now turned into pleasant fields. The natives are gone from before us and we establish peaceably in the possession of the land, enjoying our civil and religious liberties." Unquote. By 1763, however, in the midst of Pontiac's war, Woolman awakened to the impact of English colonization on the Nobbies, linking their loss of land with the oppression of enslaved Africans in North America. As he had traveled through the colonies, quote, the favorable situation of the English and the difficulties attending the natives in many places and the Negroes were open before me and here luxury and covetousness with the numerous oppressions and other evils attending them appeared very afflicting to me. And I felt in that which is immutable that the seeds of great calamity and desolation are sown and growing fast on this continent. It seems perhaps harsh to conclude that Quaker colonization in West New Jersey, which proceeded without war in the 17th century was quite similar in its results to colonization in places such as New England, New Netherland, and Virginia, where colonists used military action to destroy native towns. In West Jersey, the pacifist Quakers praised God 
for destroying Lenape's with disease, then occupied their land. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. That was wonderful. <laughs> um, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I was just wanted to say I'm very pleased to have he heard this presentation. It's the first time I've heard a presentation about the land that I actually uh, reside on. Um, very specifically, a tributary to the Big Timber Creek uh, runs a block from my house. So uh, thank you. You're welcome. I grew up on Timber Creek as well. <laughs> Gene, I loved your maps. Is there um, is there a place that we can go to to find them? The historical maps. Yeah. Okay, uh, they're in different places. The library, okay. of, the Library of Congress, is a good source. And then there's a site titled Maps Maps of PA .com. And the Lindestrom map is on that site. But if you look in you know, the 17th century section of that maps of P PA, you'll find maps there. Thank you. Um, Wall asks, where does Woolman discuss the... Um, um, my words are not working. An analog between analog <laughs> thank you plight of the Lenape and enslaved Africans okay that is in his journal uh, the quotation from 1763 is taken from Woolman's journal uh, the first quotation that I used is, is in his first essay concerning slavery which was written in 1746, but wasn't published until 1754. And uh, actually, I wanna say a bit more about that. Um, I, I read that piece and it's also, he also makes that argument in a plea for the poor. And I read that after having worked on my book, which was my dissertation on Quakers and slavery. And of course, read the, the work of, of, of Woolman on slavery. And I, I didn't think uh, much about what he was saying about Lenape's and other indigenous people at that point in time. But then in the mid nineties, I was asked to, to give a, to write a paper on Woolman and Native Americans and African Americans. And so I, I read, you know, everything I could at that point. And I, I believe he's the first person who made that analogy, who made that connection uh, between the oppression of enslaved Africans and Native Americans. Is, is your upcoming book um, going to be covering these issues? Yes, uh, a lot of what I talked about today, tonight, uh, is in the book. Uh, some is in uh, the Napi country, <laughs> um, but uh, most most is in my book, Separate Paths, yes. And actually, Separate Paths is a, a broader history of West New Jersey. I have chapter on Lenape, Swedish and Finnish and Quaker women. And I have a chapter on enslaved Africans in the book. And I have a book on the concessions of West Jersey uh, because it's an incredible document and, and really ahead of its time uh, in terms of uh, creating a Republican government for West Jersey that never went into effect, unfortunately, uh, but uh, was followed in the drawing up of the first government and the uh, laws uh, of the colony initially. 
Um, Sandy, why don't you go? Hi, Sandy. Hi, Jean. Hi, Jean. <laughs> so good to see you. Thank you so much for, for speaking and bringing these truths to us. Um, my question is really focused for you, but also, and I had put in the chat for the host and, and our hosts to consider what measures might be taken up um, to maintain our wholeness, our own health. Jean, I don't know how you do this work. I really don't know how you maintain your fortitude, not, not just the research itself, but literally even listening to you this evening. This is tender and it brings tears just to hear truths. And I don't want to just languish in truths. We need to be fruitful and work through this and get to the heart of the matter with um, reconciliations of our own spirit uh, ties to, this is a faithful community, so I'll put it that way. Um, and then other types of restitutions that can come from this. And so where are you and might you be able to guide us and, and help us on our path of healing? Well, I, I think your work um, has been moving very importantly in that direction. I, I come more from the point of view of education um, in terms of the absolute need for better uh, curriculum in New Jersey schools as a start mm -hmm. uh, in order for there to be a better understanding of the history, but also the current uh, reality that uh, Lenape's live in New Jersey now. And uh, so often you hear that all the Lenape's have left you know, or left, you know, at the end of the 18th century, and it's simply not true. Right. And I, I think it's important for, for us to understand, you know, that while the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape tribal nation is a okay. strong uh, nation in in Cumberland County. It's a good organization. It works for human rights and social issues and supports its membership. And, you know, that's a place that I would like to see, or I, I would like to, there to be more recognition in the schools of the history of, of, of uh, indigenous people in New Jersey and also the current situation. But that's that's just the start. I mean, there's so much that can be done because, you know, it's um, there's just such a gap. Uh, when I, I go to some uh, or, or read local histories or go to some historical societies, there's just not a, a good recognition of, of the role of Lenape's. Uh, they're one sentence in a book or, you know, one uh, case that shows archeological finds. And there's, there's more to our history. And, and it would benefit all of us to have a better understanding. But I, I'd love for other people to talk. You know, I, I you said four to two, <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm uh, getting to be, I am 75 years old now, you know, and it's, um, I would um, love for other people to be involved in, and research and also, uh, and, you know, spread, spread this understanding. Mm -hmm. Jack asks, um, you described the conveyances of very large blocks on land, but I did not note the dates. Were these conveyances before or after 1681? The three conveyances that I mentioned along the Delaware River were 1677. Uh, took, uh, two took place in September, one in October. Um, and then there were others, you know, I, I, 
in that on that map that showed uh, just about all of the land south of Burlington County as being involved in these conveyances. It's important to to know that these uh, these lands were not all taken up. And as far as the Lenapes were concerned, if they weren't taken up promptly, uh, that uh, agreement agreement was null. You know. And in any case, their understanding at these conferences was that they would remain on the land. I think I made that <laughs> case pretty well um, in in the discussion, but. It's true, you know, they, ex they expected to stay and not be pushed off the land. Richard asked, wasn't it common for all people at the time to ascribe disease to be as a result of God's handiwork? So might we forgive Quakers to think the same? Um, the connection was made though, that, you know, the land was opened up at the same time, you know, and so it was, wasn't just that God was causing the disease, but that also God was making way for the Quakers to settle. But if others have thoughts about that, that's, or if you have more thoughts about that. Um, we have a question from Bonnie. Why don't you go ahead? Hi, Jean. Nice to see you. Hi, Bonnie. Good to um, see you. I just wanted. To, <laughs> I just wondered. You were talking about how the Indians were, or the Lenape were believing that they had an Indian line, and they were um, on the head of the creek, and that was where they were supposed to remain. I noticed also on the map that showed the conveyances that the Pine Barrens and the um, Burlington County area was not included in that. Was that because they were generally becoming more into the center of the state at that time? Um, there, there, I've seen a diagram of the, the Indian line um, in the Burlington area, Burlington County area. Um, I can't actually remember who drew that line, you know, so that it, it's, it's uh, I'm not sure about that, but it was further west than the, the colonists wanted to believe it was, according to the, the deeds, you know, the deeds or the conveyances they had written, which went all the way to the heads of the stream. And if you if you look at the maps, I mean, that was most of New Jersey, uh, and it is if you look at the heads of the streams, but they had already walked off that eastern line, which was then called by the, the colonists the Indian line. The, the, the fact that I don't have um, indicated on that map in the uh, agreements in Burlington, it's because there were quite a few conveyances that were that still exist, but the description of the boundaries is so vague that I didn't have the patience mm -hmm. to try to figure out uh, what they refer to. Uh, a number of them refer to the forks of the Rancocas. Others. Uh, referred to the area further closer to the Atlantic Ocean. And so it may well be that the uh, colonists carved out all of the land just as they did south of that line uh, in South Jersey, mm -hmm. but I wasn't able to uh, distinguish exactly what those boundaries were. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Johnny asks, would you incorporate native history into the Amstead Act? Into? I, I didn't and hear the last part of what you said. The Amistad Act? The Amistad Act. 
I don't, I don't know uh, what the Amis, I've heard of the Amistad Act, but I am not familiar with the details. Can I ask the question? Um, why don't we let Jack go and then, then you can go. Excuse me, I had to unmute myself. Uh, Jean, my question was, was about the extent of those conveyances. Uh, if they were all in the, in the late 1700s, in six, or 1670s, uh, 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 Henry Jennings bought 300 acres of land from two Indians in 1681 uh, in Salem County, what is now Salem County, at the, and the only identification of where it was was on Little Creek. Now, could it be that Henry bought land that had already been conveyed by the tribes to somebody else? <laughs> this is a double purchase. Well, the I um, I mentioned a few of those uh, conveyances in my talk, though I, I talked about them pretty quickly. There were cases in which individuals, uh, you could say, repurchased the land from the Lenapes after the West Jersey proprietors had done so, or John Fenwick had done so. I think the area that you're discussing was actually uh, agreed upon later. Was out, let me put it th this way. It was outside the bounds of the Fenwick deeds. Okay. The Fenwick conveyances. All right, because Henry came over in the second boat on 1677 to the Fenwick colony. Mm -hmm. And a copy of that deed, by the way, was uh, at the entrance of the uh, Native American exhibit at the State Museum. You come in right in the door on the right-hand side. I don't know if it's still there. It was there mm -hmm. several years ago. Yeah, I've, I've seen a copy of it. Um, mm -hmm. But I, so I believe, that, and this is my, my thinking here, that some colonists made these individual agreements with Lenapis, even though they obtained deeds through the proprietor as well, mm -hmm. uh, because Lenapis lived in the area and they wanted to make good relations uh, with the Lenapis. So they exchanged gifts. Uh, they themselves had the, de the deed or conveyance written down and they asked the uh, Lenape leaders to sign it, um, which they did. And then they kept that, that uh, conveyance, that document. But it, it, the Lenapes expected reciprocity. They expected to stay on the land. Mm -hmm. They were making treaties with the colonists, not selling their land. They were making treaties with the colonists for joint use of resources and land rather than outright sale. And so that's why we see these um, individual documents as well as the larger documents from the, the proprietors that the proprietors had. Well, there, there is no, no indication of that, that that kind of a, a double use in the, the actual wording of the deed. So mm -hmm. perhaps this was to establish exclusive uh, control of that land or exclusive ownership of that land without letting the Indians use it too? Well, Henry Jennings may have wanted to establish that, but he was the one writing it. And you know, we don't know what he said to the Lenapis, the Kohansics. Uh, what they thought um, he was writing. I, um, I, I think many Kohansics learned a fair amount of English uh, within a few years, but that didn't mean that they were given access, you know, to, well, they signed the document, but that doesn't mean they could have read the writing. So I, the Lenapis mm -hmm. and the colonists had di two different ideas uh, about land ownership. Oh, yeah. Um, the Lenapis wanted to share. They were trading in a treaty for that right to share the land. 
whereas the many of the colonists wanted full ownership. You know, but yeah. Yeah, well, one understanding is that the uh, at the Native Americans thought they were really getting a good deal because they weren't giving up anything really, and they were getting all these neat things, you know, like <laughs> like uh, match match coats and uh, match m m matches of powder and bars of lead and that sort of thing uh, for nothing because uh, you know I they they didn't commonly known and is this correct that they didn't have a concept of land ownership as the English did. Well, I've, I've, I just I recently read that in uh, a local history, and it, it's not correct because they knew that they owned land. It was their land. They were sovereign in that, that area. Uh -huh. But it was a different kind of land ownership. And it was one in which no individual person could state that they owned land, rather it was an ownership by the group uh, of people. And they had leaders who met in treaty with others, but those leaders were not individual owners of the land in most situations. Now, over time that changes and some uh, Lenapes do gain land in fee simple under the English law, but under uh, Lenape law, um, there was no individual land ownership. Thank you. You're welcome. Johnny, you're up. Um, the question I had uh, pertained before to the uh, Amistad Act. And uh, what I was referring to is that the Amistad Act was the act, uh, the bill that was passed by Bill Payne that required the teaching of African American history uh, for schools in New Jersey. So my question to you was in regard to the fact of incorporating that in terms of uh, Native American history, since you were talking about the Lenape. So my question was in terms of, uh, would that be something you would be considering putting into that Amistad Act or be a uh, component to the Amistad Act? Well, I, I think an act or similar to that would be very useful, yes. Um, I know that the New Jersey Historical Commission is very interested in working with teachers mm -hmm. um, and uh, to create um, you know, curriculum uh, for Native Americans. Uh, we just had, I was part of a committee over the past year uh, to uh, work with the New Jersey Historical Commission and uh, various uh, Lenape groups in the state and other, and archeologists you know, to work on programming on Native Americans in New Jersey. And we had a conference in November. And after that conference ended, it was clear that the teachers who attended it, it was on Zoom, but the, the teachers attended the conference and said, we absolutely need to have curriculum, and, you know, so that to help us teach about, about indigenous people in the state, you know, because they need the resources to do that. And so there's going to be another committee, I understand I'm not part of it, uh, that will work on that with teachers. And I'm sure that they'll use the Amistad Act as a model for, mm -hmm. for that. That yeah, was like, yeah, it was mentioned. <laughs> and like you, I've heard, I've heard. I'm from Northern New Jersey, so okay. uh, like you, I've heard those comments that there are no more Lenape in New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. Alice had a question thank about you. the um, the pronunciation of Lenape. Do you know anything about that? Yes, uh, Lenape, Lenape um, is the way that Lenape people pronounce the word. And I grew up saying Lenape. And um, a lot of people in South Jersey say Lenape. And, uh, but it is Lenape. Um. 
Deb, did you have a question? No, Jean answered it. I was curious about uh, where the Lenape, the Lenape are now, and you're saying Cumberland County, uh, or have they dispersed a lot throughout the state? The, 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 there are three Lenape groups recognized by, uh, actually, uh, I'm not quite sure about three, but the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape Tribal Nation is recognized by the state of New Jersey as a tribal nation. And the Ramapo people in northern, far northern New Jersey are also recognized as a, a Lenape nation. And so these are groups of people who are organized as as um, groups who uh, are seeing their ancestry uh, with uh, in the in the uh, you know they they look back to their ancestors as Lenapis in New Jersey and also in the case of the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape group in Cumberland County. Uh, that they include uh, people who have come from the uh, from Delaware and Northern Maryland as well, the Nanticoke people. Now, there are probably Lenape people in other parts of New Jersey as well. Uh, there's also a group uh, near the uh, New Jersey coast, the Sand Hill. Indians. Um, I think they're uh, headquartered in Tom's River in that area. Hmm. But there are Native Americans of other groups, uh, you know, who have come to New Jersey and who, you know, identify themselves as Native Americans on the census. So it's not just Lenapis who live in, in New Jersey. And then of course, many Lenapis have moved to Pennsylvania and are now farther west. There are two uh, groups in, two Delaware groups in Oklahoma. And there are also Lenape people in Wisconsin and in Canada. So uh, there are many different groups of Lenapis. Thank you. You're welcome. Walt asks, is there comparable knowledge about Lenape holdings in the Brandywine Valley passing into European control? Um, the conveyances I know about for Pennsylvania are the ones that were uh, negotiated by William Penn. And I believe, yeah, they include the Brandywine Valley. And whether there were individual negotiations as well, like we were talking about earlier, I don't know. I, I haven't, although I focus to a certain extent on Pennsylvania in my work for the Napi country, the previous book, I didn't do the more detailed work on deeds for that book as I did for, for uh, the West Jersey book, Separate Paths. Ms. Jones, do you have a question? Uh, just more of a comment, um, Jean, thank you so much. I just loved this talk. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to share that I live in Rancocas and um, across the street from the meeting house in the little <laughs> village. And down the road is, was the uh, Rancocas Indian Reservation, and it was okay. Rancocas Nanticoke Tribal. You said the full name, but it was that. And when I first moved here in 2001, 
there was every year a huge powwow huge okay yeah and I would go every year I loved it um I tried to volunteer there but they didn't really want me to help around um and sadly about seven years ago they lost their land because they couldn't pay the taxes and I, I was devastated to find this. Um, and they just scattered. I mean, no one, the organization kind of dropped out from the center or so that was what I heard from different people. Um, and just to wrap that little narrative up, this past semester at the College of New Jersey, I taught a first year seminar on uh, prisons, incarceration nation. And one of my students was from that tribe and his name is Justice, which I just love. And he's the new generation. And he's already started a group on the campus and awareness. And so I'm really working with him and his group to help them, you know, find their voice and their 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 agency. Um, because it's a it's a rocky road, but I believe in justice. So I just right. wanted to share that. Right. Thank you. I, I, I also uh, attended one of their powwows. And you know, the Ramapo also had state recognition. Uh, and, and Governor Chris Christie removed the state recognition from all of the Indian groups in the state. And I wasn't clear on whether the Ramapo, not the Ramapo, Renapi, the Renapi, that's the group. Uh, whether they uh, had uh, obtained you know, their recognition again, because I thought that they were not actually organized as you just explained. Yeah, the Ramapo have recognition and the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape have recognition at this point in time. That's right. Thank you very much for letting me know. Um, so we have a few minutes left. Um, a couple people were asking um, if they um, about contact information for Eugene. Are you comfortable sharing that? Um, this is recorded, right? You know what? How about we talk about that later? Right. Uh, okay. I could perhaps I could send uh, Linda my well. She has my email address. So could Linda, could you somehow maybe folks let who would suggest, like let me suggest this. Um why don't um when Josh sends out information when we've got this recording posted, um we can give you the email address for um Haddonfield meeting and um people could send mail, you know, to me through you and that way we would, you know. That way the information would get to you and you could reply to people. Yeah, as you I mean, I, I'm comfortable sending my email address to everyone here. Okay. I just don't want it to be on YouTube. Sure, yes. So, okay. Well, okay. We'll include that in the email that goes out to everyone with the link then. Okay, great. That's a Thank much you. easier way to do it. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there anyone who um, didn't get to ask a question or um, anyone I missed in the chat who would like to go now? Eric? Tend to make sure I was unmuted. For those of you from South Jersey, uh, recently we had a cross pollinization of South Jersey and North Jersey as far as both um, Caucasian American and Native American cultures were concerned. Uh, one of the Salem Oak seedlings, which was uh, brought up by the state of New Jersey at their uh, greenhouse in Jackson, uh, which had been collected the year before the Salem Oak tree fell, was ceremoniously uh, planted uh, in Walpack, which is, you can't get much more remote from South Jersey than Walpack. It's 150 miles away. And there's now a Salem Oak um, 
probably no more than about 150 yards from the same Delaware River, just a whole lot further north. And uh, assisting me, I was John Fenwick. Uh, assisting me was a, a chief of the Ramapo Nation. Uh, so we had an opportunity to talk about both uh, uh, the history of, of both peoples from both ends of the West Jersey proprietorship and simultaneously talk about the present and the future relative to mutual concern about the environment and our natural resources. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, if you'd like, uh, I'd be more than happy to send you a copy. The, there is a full description of that. I think I actually sent one to Bonnie. Um, and uh, I'd be more than happy to send one up to you, Jane, if you'd like, uh, you can share it with others. Um, there's a full description of that ceremony along with pictures in the uh, Wolpac Historical Society newsletter that uh, was published maybe a couple of weeks ago. The other thing I wanted to say is, while this is certainly uh, an empathetic group on issues of Native Americans, um, one thing that I've found extremely frustrating uh, and the more you examine this issue, um, the sadder it becomes because, uh, because of the disbursement of Lenape people, uh, which was early and was extensive. Uh, the tribesmen who were in Oklahoma view I won't say with contempt, but it is not um, with great uh, compassion. Um, many of their tribal people that are here in New Jersey, and I've actually heard the, uh, the expression, oh, the wannabe Lenapes. And I'm going, why would they take such an attitude? And, those who have visited from Oklahoma to Pennsylvania recently, um, they're not very charitable about people who should be considered their kinsmen um, in ways that would benefit all of them mutually. And I only mention that as a cautionary tale because you may stumble upon this situation while you are thinking that you're talking to one group and you find out that there's conflicts even within this same tribal nation. And it's very sad to witness, uh, but it is uh, life in our time after all of those years and those separations, that there are groups of Lenape that just don't really want to recognize some of the others. And there has been, of course, naturally, uh, an intermingling both of tribes and with Black Americans. Uh, that is to be expected over so many generations, but it's, it's, it's looked upon with disdain on the part of those who consider themselves the true Lenape. So um, don't be surprised if you come across that. didn't want to dampen your enthusiasm, just recognize that human nature is not always the way we'd like it to be. Gene, can I make a quick question about the, uh, the nature of Lenape's are still in the area? The question is, when the Brotherton Indian Reservation uh, went away, dissolved, I know most of them were moved to Oklahoma. Do you know what percentage actually stayed in the area or have any information about that? When I first started uh, this project in the 90s, my goal was to make, you know, to find that out, but I could not. The problem is in trying to connect uh, Lenape's from the 17th century, to even the 19th century, even the 19th century. It's quite difficult because of the, the federal census, um, which um, 
did not identify uh, Native people in uh, the states, you know, only in uh, parts of the country that were not settled <laughs> and established as states and territories were indigenous people uh, counted in any numbers. So that the Napis who remained in New Jersey were char uh, characterized as either uh, blacks, free blacks or whites and so that they were not identified as, as Lenapis. And so when names are quite similar, like I was trying to trace the Still family uh, in the mid 18th century, you know, there was a, a uh, conference with the New Jersey Indian commissioners and the, uh, heads of various Lenape groups and their names were listed. And I tried to connect them, to trace them, to do genealogy, if you will, uh, with those people. And I got stuck uh, because the records simply weren't there. Now, tribal nations, tribal, you know, and families have those records, those genealogical records. But as a historian, I, I couldn't do that work. So I uh, gave up on so that. So you don't know of any, any, uh, any, any documents that would contain the names of the people that lived on the Brotherton Reservation? Um, yes, well, the, that uh, listing that I just mentioned. Okay. Uh, actually, that was before that, that listing, but some of those people, did live on the Brotherton Reservation. And there are some names. Uh, yeah, we know the names of some of the people who lived on the Brotherton Reservation. But what we can't do is, or what I wasn't able to do, I'm not saying nobody can do it. And in fact, that was before ancestry.com, so maybe you could do it now. But I couldn't make the connections through uh, censuses or through tax records. Um, the documents I knew about as a historian at the time, I couldn't make those connections and trace them over, you know, several centuries or even decades. Um, hmm. So that work may be possible. I, uh, it may certainly be possible, but it's, I didn't. But I can say that um, based on uh, contacts I've had with families, that some people absolutely stayed in the Burlington area, in the Pine Barrens area, and then of course um, uh, in the Cumberland County area where came the, the descendants of, many descendants of Kozancic, Kohansics live today. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the discussion and I, I do hope you'll get in touch with me. So thank you. Thank you, Jean.